This is the Lydian Spin, episode number 181 with Tim Dahl coming back from his Christmas holidays. Well, I am. And it, and this is, I, I guess, officially the New Year's uh, holiday. And I don't necessarily want to reflect on the whole year because it's it's a complicated one. It's kind of like the world's open, but everyone's fucked up. No time for that. Uh, but I will segue in this. I just drove, I drove in today. Um as they said before this, uh, what do you call it, a cyclone bomb? Whatever, bomb, whatever the bo- bomb cyclone. By, yeah, yeah, okay. So, gazillion flights canceled. A hundred million cars on the road. It's like really another absurd. one coming this weekend. Correct. I waited. I I, I waited until Christmas Eve because my mom lives in Massachusetts, and it's a, normally about a five hour drive. I got up, which I don't get up early, but I did this time. Um, and we did it in four hours. So so I we know. by waiting, that that was beautiful. Well, and we know that it can be from four to seven hours. No, no, no Doesn't problem. matter. There's yeah. devastation all over the fucking country. And Buffalo, close to where, and I asked you this before all that went down, because you grew up in Rochester. And for whatever reason, the lake effect is a little worse in Buffalo. I, I I don't know what's going on there. Well, like I've said before, I've I remember six foot snow drifts, but not six feet of snow. <laughs> That's well, outrageous. A shitload of people died. Um, it's unbelievable. I mean, it and just, it's not over. It's not over. It's coming again this weekend. Well, anyway, uh, to kick this off, uh, let's go down further south. And for some reason, we often have stories about, and how could we not? Florida. So now the annual quote unquote Florida man and women awards of 2022, which are the wackiest crimes to come out of the sunshine state. And they're just pretty ridiculous. I didn't know that the term the Florida man has gone viral and has become synonymous with the outrageous crimes committed by residents there. So the year started off with a woman who is attempting to get out of a DUI by performing an Irish folk dance for an officer. <laughs> well, you, um, well, I wonder what it was called because I do know a little about folk dances, believe it or not. And well, one of the, one, it, I, I want to hear this, but, but, but I have to say it. One of the classic ones from the 19th century was the Irish dump. And that, and that's dump, spelled dump. D- D-U-M-P-E. But keep on going. But I All wonder right. if it well, was anyway, the Irish dump. Yeah. I have no I, I don't know. But anyway, right. it didn't work for her. So body camera footage showed the moment a Madeira Beach woman attempted to get out of a DUI by proving her sobriety with an Irish dance. Amy Harrington, 38, showed signs of inebriation, including having bloodshot, watery eyes. When she rear-ended a car one mile away, and they say accidents always happen close to home from her home. So officers who arrived on the scene, they ordered her to take a test by walking in a straight line, but said that she would rather instead do an Irish jig. As she began to stumble, she recovered by doing multiple ballet and Irish folk dance move but the, that uh, sounds about correct that the officer about... said wasn't good enough and she was arrested nice refused to take a blood alcohol contest and was charged with driving under the influence now that was the beginning of the year may 12th woman a florida woman crossed getting arrested off her bucket list now speaking about a dumb dance florida teenager was arrested for driving recklessly uh in key largo and admitted to police that had been on her bucket list since high school. Uh, Shania Shamamiracle Douglas flagged down by police after a short pursuit that concluded when she stopped at an intersection. The arrest affidavit reads, the suspect stated getting arrested was on her bucket list. She was taken to jail. Oh, my oh, God. please. All right. July 4th, Florida man arrested for throwing a hot dog. What good is that going to do at an officer? Jason yeah. Stroll. Could be dangerous. Could be dangerous. Hey, I mean, if it's one of Not the hot dog, you throw anything at a cop, you might get shot. Well, well, he was white, so he didn't get shot. Jason Stroll became agitated when a St. Pete's officer approached him after his, yeah, about his expired vendor permit while he was in the middle of a shift. So Stroll ignored the officer's warning and continued selling hot dogs on the street. When an officer requested he abandon his post, uh, Stroll became upset and tossed a hot dog at the officer. It was arrested on a felony charge. All right. All right. All right. It goes uh, on. July 29th, Florida man stole a trunk 
and drove to a Space Force base to warn of aliens. I mean, a truck. Ah. Corey Johnson stole a truck on July 29th while on a mission for the president, according to the WFLA. He had taken a truck from Riviera Beach and drove to Patrick Space Force Base to warn about aliens and Chinese hmm. dragons. Okay. He arrived at the base claiming the president told him to be there. But he was arrested for motor theft. He sounds like well, it's either schizophrenic or he's on uh, a amphetamine uh, psychosis. Well, uh, I'm just going to top it off with the latest one because there are there are many many more. But December second, Florida man arrested for having sex with a golden doodle. What? What's that? Well, what's a golden doodle? It's uh, a dog. Oh, okay. Right. Chad right. Mason was caught having sex with a pup in front of children before he ran to a nearby church to wreck a nativity scene and attempted to steal a car. Arrested for a lewd exhibition, exposure of sexual organs, and having sex with well, a It's dog. interesting because there was that article about the, the gang rape of a lizard in India. Oh, uh, my God. And, and, and so the top, honestly, with all sincerity, the top, sex psychologists like the leading researchers on just the psychology <laughs> of sex they say bestiality is so taboo there actually isn't really good information and in science on it because like no one wants to even address if this happens well it's nothing but, new, but, but it, I, I, it's nothing new exactly so so what is that so there there were two young males in the university of pittsburgh who've been arrested they're, they're allegedly you know they're, they're they have the lawyers for molesting a corpse um i mean to me that makes a little bit more sense than well, molesting a dog well you know so i read that you know the the, the uh the headlines are very sensational and um there there's med students they're 19 year old boys who were playing with a corpse and they were kind of like coming up with scenarios like, oh, God, get me off. Oh, wait, 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 where was the corpse? Is it a science it, class? It, it, it was, it was in like one of these like, you know, med school. All right. Okay. Well, what did you say? University of uh, Pittsburgh sure. and they were doing some comedy thing. They didn't penetrate it. There was like touching the guy like, oh, I like this person. It's a corpse. Well, because everyone's so sensitive now, they got turned in and now because because the corpse was donated for science by the family, yeah. everyone's offended, and these guys might go to jail. They might ruin their whole fucking careers because there was basically one, basically someone like, hey, my friends are drinking on the weekend. I mean, I'm not condoning fucking around the corpse, but 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 when you read after the after the headlines, when you read what happened, it's ah, they were just two nine year old boys making comedy out of a fucking corpse frat boy fun it happens yeah, yeah exactly well exactly. that may be a laugh riot but the good men project which is something i refer to occasionally because i like their articles seven and it, it is the time really seven strange and unexpected benefits of sadness a lot of people uh -huh. are having sadness during the holiday and you know yeah, it just goes it. goes in i mean i'm drawing to the very end of you know the final edits for artist depression anxiety and rage but this is an interesting because it shows that strangely enough anxiety and shame which i've never felt either can compel us to improve our social skills anger can motivate us to stop hitting our kids and get into therapy guilt can push us to admit our fuck-ups and ultimately do the right thing but sadness sadness a improves memory which is strange, but while well, rainy, sense to me. Makes rainy sense and gloomy days yield sadness, they can currently improve our recollection of details of objects. In fact, on a bright and sunny day, when we normally feel happy, our memory will actually be less accurate. Happiness impairs attention and memory. Sadness improves it. Sadness increases skepticism and reduces effects of various distractions. I mean, when we're sad, we're less likely to stereotype and fall for irreverent, false, or misleading information found in marketing, which is interesting. So it makes, it the, makes sense too. Makes sadness. Sense. All this makes sense to me. Better's judgment. If we suffer from occasional petty sadness, petty sadness, there's no such thing, we're more likely to fend off common judgmental biases. For instance, attributing intentionality to other people's behavior 
while ignoring situational factors. I'm not so sure. I might have to reinvestigate this. Well, I, I wonder, so the more sociopathic you are and the less sadness you feel, or maybe even less joy you feel, is that why there's sometimes pedal to the metal stimulation uh, to, to basically stimulate the brain for well, any kind of... Uh, Thing that doesn't uh, naturally occur. But I don't know. Well, I mean, number four on the list is sadness inspires and motivates. Happiness is like a giant neon billboard with the world's with the words "you're safe" written on it. There is not much we need to change when we're happy. Nor who, who, is it. Who, who did this? Uh, this is this a, a study. It's a study. Hang on, I'm just going to tell you from the uh, University of. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. It almost seems non-scientific, but I like it. I like it. I, I, well, I, I think it's... I'm not. I mean, I agree with some of this. Okay. Right. Sadness helps with breakup recovery for it indicates we're nearing acceptance and thus it should generate hope. It yeah, also yeah. promotes reflection and makes discerning, learning and growing from the mistakes we've made in our last relationship easier. And finally, it helps us to make sense of our loss and life following it. Put differently, sadness helps us find ourselves this again. seems pretty subjective to me well but, and it but, says but here, here but I, I think they're, i think it's all good advice i think well, it's all here, good advice okay, it's saying that okay sadness is not something you should try to banish or suppress the trick is feeling it but not reacting negatively because of it which is true you got to go through it you just got to let it go you got to go through it so these were modern philosophers like mark manson and ryan holiday this is drawing from this, and the the uh, author of the article is Max Janker. Okay, so I think that this has some pretty good. Okay, I so, think it's interesting, but but the thing is, again, what you dive in deep, sadness, uh, ref, uh, suffering through reflection on a maybe a bad situation. Duration is a big factor. Like, like well, how, then, how yeah, quickly is, you get through it. So well, some, some not, people are crying for fucking 10 years. Some people are this crying is not, for... no, this art, this, okay. So the research was based on cognitive benefits thanks to the advent of MRI imagining. And so in this article, the point is, this is not about full-blown depression. It's about a temporary state of sadness, which is, you know, because nobody actually wants to be sad in order that I want to be depressed, but this just validates the original point of the article that bad feelings are not necessarily bad, but you know, well, sadness kind of isn't, a, isn't bad. It's sad. It's not bad or good. It's just sadness. Well, and look, get over it. Go through ah, it. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, it's uh, not there, a full blown depression. You can't tell somebody that because there's no just getting over. I mean, it. when I'm, when I'm sad or if I'm very happy or whatever, I mean, these are filters for, for the, environment and and the situations that i'm imbibing so uh they're they're, they're relief they're relief I, I don't hold things and I, I i let them go wait no we neither of us do i can't i'm rarely sad i'm never i at this point i can't even imagine being sad because i just and it's it's an acceptance but it's not a subservience to the situation it's just a i accept and then do my best to go further to provide myself with not necessarily happiness, but satisfaction in understanding what reality truly is and how it's basically a perceptional <laughs> construct. So Fair. part of my reality, that's the way I can deal with it. But then again, I don't have uh, deep rooted depression, anxiety, shame, humiliation, or any of those things that right. my documentary talks about. So I'm very lucky. I think so are you, Tim, because we both are Pretty happy chappies. Well, I will be sad. Oh, gosh. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know if it's empathy. Well, I, ta empathy. I tap into other 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 realities uh, sometimes. You're, and, you're and, the, one of the most empathetic people I know. Exactly. You're an empath, actually. Exactly. So it's... it's um, yeah. But there's a lot of sadness out there. So There so, is. So... And, and, you can't yeah. let it hold you fucking down. Well, and it's one of the reasons I feel that sad or depressed people are drawn to me because I'm I'm not, but I get it. I get it. And I don't judge it. I allow it. I try to improve it. But I also know there's so many variables. So all I could do is try to be a chuckle fucker. Well, uh... <laughs>
and, and laughing way, at myself now. Oh, oh, and by the way, we, I mean, I we don't, I don't mean to digress too much, but go ahead. With all, I've said it before, with all the pain, with all the suffering, with all the problems that our human experience has been throughout history. Yes. There is not one universal tunnel vision way to filter it in a healthy way. There are many. And, uh, and, yeah. and, and activism, uh, affection, you know, all, all the t- typical uh, and maybe banal ways humans uh, have claimed that are the best ways to deal with it. They're not the only ones to. And my grammar is pretty bad, but I'll, I'll keep on going. Laughter. And, and and humor and and joy are very healthy and acceptable ways of dealing with tragedy, pain, and sadness. So absolutely. Yes. Yes. All right. So, well, <laughs> what more can we say? I don't know what to say. This Happy is, New uh, Year. Happy New this Year. Is everyone. Episode number 181, the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. Happy everything. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, Derek Bostrom, the drummer and one of the original members of the Meat Puppets. Hey, thanks for coming up. It's my pleasure. Happy holidays. I, I was going to say happy Halloween, but that's every day for me. That was good. Well, that's <laughs> feel, uh, Christmas feels like Halloween for me. I got turned into a monster. Yes, exactly. Derek and I were just talking about because I just came back from my mother's and just all the holiday travel. Of course, there's a lot of chaos. Some people died. And you were telling a story. You were visiting your brother in Flagstaff. You live in Phoenix, correct? Correct. Yep. And not, and so not a bit of snow. Well, not where they are living. And then it dumped like six inches today. So really? Okay. All right. Yeah. Flagstaff. Yeah. It, it, sure. So so what's what's the uh what's the traffic like between Flagstaff and uh Phoenix during the holiday dash? Well, um, there's an awful lot of truckers on the road, and it's largely going up into the mountains. So I'm not going to lie. Um, uh, as an old fart, I just think to myself, there's like 16-year-olds. They let 16-year-olds drive these semi-trucks now, and they don't seem to know how to do it. And I just like give them a wide berth. Because um, the thing yeah. that I realize about truckers is um, they don't want to slow down because they know how much uh, they're, they're, they're responsible for their own brake work. So every time they touch their brakes, it costs them money. So is, is that? Oh, oh, that's what the whole brrr, when they're downshifting because they don't want to touch the brakes. I didn't know it, that. It, well, they they don't want to do anything that will uh, cost them money, and they're freelancers, of course, and so they're getting squeezed just like Amazon and UPS drivers and stuff. So they're usually fairly stressed out about making their bones. And um, God, we got stuck uh, on the way home. We got uh, somebody rolled their car oh. and. Um, I just like screamed at him out the window, you fucking idiot. And uh, the Amazon <laughs> driver is it's just like, you know, there are no accidents on the road. And uh, the Amazon driver is like, fuck this, I'm going around. And it's just like, I know you're going to get fired if you're a second late. So you got a lot of um, business going on on the road. And when you're driving up and down the mountains, uh, it's kind of nerve wracking. I had to, I used to have to do tech support here in, in, uh, in Arizona. And some of it I have to do in Flagstaff. I drove up there once a month. So, um, I'm, you know, familiar, familiar with it. So, <laughs> well, soon it'll all be drones. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, no, I'm, I'm talking about the state of music, actually. Okay. Well, I've been, I've been enjoying the, the drone footage of the, of the, uh, frozen, uh, wasteland that is the, the Northeast right now. That's. Oh, Ni- Ni- Niagara yeah. Falls looks beautiful. Frozen. That's I know. Gorgeous. Amazing. Were you ever with all the years of touring, did you yeah. ever have any really close calls with trucks or or uh, interstates or just vehicles? I seems like we've all all touring musicians at some point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, what? And, um, Ron um, on his way back from Austin just a couple of days ago, he was like a mile away from home, and some dickhead sideswiped his car at ninety miles an hour and took his his side view mirror off. And I'm just like, yeah, that's too close. That's no, close. Yeah. We got caught in a couple of different blizzards. Um, we also were in, uh, in the, uh, 
the hurricane, we were right smack in the middle of the hurricane that hit uh, the UK in, in 1987. We were literally out on outside because our van had, uh, we'd gotten, our van was falling apart and we were trying to drive to uh, Portsmouth and the, the trees began to fall and we kept trying to double back and trying to find a way forward. And finally we got completely trapped by power lines and, and, uh, and uh, uh, trees. So we, uh, walked to an open field where we figured we'd be the most safe because the trees were falling all around. Oh us. boy! There was a uh, cemetery, <laughs> and uh, we watched the eye of the hurricane go over, and then it started to to kick up again. So we like pounded on the door of one of the uh, one of the locals who who let us stashed us in like their um, their guest house overnight until we uh, you know in the next morning we got up and uh, joined the power saw brigade trying to open up the roads <laughs> in Spain. It took us like. 24 hours to get from london to portsmouth so yeah uh the road is definitely <laughs> so uh, what was it what was a um and i i do want to go back to the beginnings of your your music or maybe even your life but what were what was a 1987 what, what did i'm sorry a 1987 meat puppets uk tour look like besides a, a hurricane like what size venues what was the what was the audience because that was I mean, seven years into the band already now so and, and, there was yeah. attention. Yes, okay. and you guys were on SST, which already had a buzz, right? And so with a certain circle. And uh, eighty seven was our our first tour, and um, uh, you know we were playing. I remember we we uh, we uh, I don't remember the the band we played with, but Gene October was backstage. You all remember Gene October from Chelsea, and uh, he was drunk and he was like, oh, Gene October, don't you fuck with me." And so we were like, okay. But uh, I remember uh, Wavos had come out, our rec our second record in 87. And- um, Which I, hang, on, hang on a second, because I read about Wavos, highly influenced by a band I also love, ZZ Top. Yes. Um, and the loudest band I ever saw play, I must say. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the loudest band I ever saw was the Ramones, but- uh, Well, I don't know where you saw them, but anyway. Well, by uh, yeah, the time so, you got to ZZ Top, maybe your hearing had already been damaged. Jesus, and maybe I'd, I'd <laughs> shaved that night, so I couldn't. Maybe I had, a, you know, a hairball in my ear. I have no idea. But this anyway, so their, this would have been the Ramones in '78, so I was still uh, new to loud music. Anyway, okay, so Quavo's Quavo's UK tour. What yeah. size? The question was, what size? Well, well, what's small? we got? Where are you playing? No, yeah. small. Nothing, nothing too fancy. Um, the usual. I mean. Just the regular indie circuit, alt circuit. We were certainly not playing stadiums. Probably, you know, anywhere from two to five hundred seaters. They're not, not. We've never been popular except for in 1994. But uh, one of the weeklies trashed the record. I, it was it was Melody Maker. They like they called us uh, hippie beanbags from hell. And well, okay, let, let, let you know what. Not a bad description of a certain point in the Meat Puppets. Very muse, the musical schizophrenia, you know, which really defines what the Meat Puppets were. So, my being a musical schizophrenic myself, that doesn't lead necessarily to great popularity because no. people never know what to expect, and that should be, and that is our calling card. Well, the because, thing about Wavos was it was the first record. Well, our, our, it was basically the first record since our first EP, which we recorded in 81, where we got even a semblance of like a live vibe in the studio. And we were real proud of it. Of course, we knocked it out in three days, the whole thing. And, and why shouldn't you? <laughs> well, because <laughs> making records is, is hard work for uh, people with high ambitions and low talent like we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you know the songs, you record them and you, you, and, you know, pr print. I mean, I, I don't know. I've never had a problem with that. But the, the, I want to go back to the musical schizophrenia for a minute, because that's what to me defines what the meat pu puppets were and still are. And I'm just wondering if there was because, you know, so many bands claim they were influenced by you from Nirvana, Soundgarden, all that period. But I'm wondering if they were truly influenced, they too would have been musical schizophrenics and nobody else holds that banner. Just because they like the stuff that they've heard by us doesn't necessarily mean that they like us. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's plenty of good stuff out there that they could totally hate if they really tried. Well, well, well bottle, I, bottle surfers were kind of musical schizophrenics and you, you yeah, worked with, you yeah, worked with yeah. Paul. Well, Paul Larry. We, yeah. we were, um, you know, like, we all came from different things. Kurt, um, 
he, he both both the boys were escaping from the straight world when I met him, and I was uh, a freak from day one. And I was really into like punk rock and the Carpenters, you know that kind of shit. And um, we had all gotten into the Dead, yada yada yada. But Kurt was really into you know Led Zeppelin, and he was trying to get become a, a band, a, a bar band guy, and he, or <laughs> doing like you know bar mitzvah bands and stuff, and kept getting kicked out of him. <laughs> Then he tried acid and it blew his mind. And yep. um, it improved the music, no doubt. Well, he, it, it, it wasn't until <laughs> I, I like tapped him on the shoulder and said, we're going to start a band where you can do anything you want. And I was into punk. So uh, now Chris, our bass player, he was not into punk. So we had to talk him into it. And back when I was uh, talking with Kurt last week, you told me about how he had to twist his brother's arm to come and play with uh, punk rocker me. <laughs> well, I mean, but, okay, wait, 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 but wait, when you say punk rock, it's such a generic term. Like right before you're starting the Meat Puppets, 1980, it starts. What were your favorite bands at that time that were like, oh, yeah, that's it for me? I mean, you said you saw the Ramones in 78, but, you know, well, what, were, what were the other things that really you know grabbed you by the balls? I, I can certainly tell you that I bought no, no New York when it came out. Yeah, well, I don't hear the influence on any of the Meat Puppets records yet, but maybe there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we really liked the Germs. Um, well, 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 well uh, uh, Don's from Phoenix, right? This is true. I liked it before he joined. I liked. I really liked forming. And now I was into anything I could get my hands on in Phoenix, really, until I ran out of money. I bought it all. I was just like the last records I was buying was I was buying pop group, pop group in the fall and public image like everybody else. But before that, I would, you know, if I could find a single by Slaughter and the Dogs or Johnny Moped, I was just in heaven. <laughs> uh, but also the the residents. And uh, so, you know, I was into punk rock from about age 17, around 1977. What was and, the... Excuse me, Chad, but at that point, there were so many records coming out of the UK as opposed to America. There were very few records coming out at that point as, as compared to how many singles and bands were actually getting things out in the UK, yeah. which well, a I lot like of the, the bands you named were the, from the UK. Yeah, I like the LA bands. I followed all the, the bands on Danger House and what yeah. and uh, um, Slash records and stuff. I loved that stuff. Um, some of the X, this, X was great, it's yep, still X. great, yeah. And you know, then then the New York bands I could get my hands on, they were a little bit more, um, they were they were they were, they were a little older, you know. A lot of them had started earlier, a lot of the LA bands were younger, like, and so their sensibility was a little closer to my own. Was it was, it was it was it was it all that, or was it also because it just LA is not as far from Phoenix as New York, and would these bands come through and you would get to see them more often? Well, we, there, there was a club that uh, that was starting to have bands come over around 1980, and so I got to see the the plugs, and I got to see, um, uh, never saw the Germs, saw X, saw the Go Go's when they before they were <laughs> um, stuff like that. Uh, saw the Weirdos, um, saw the Alley Cats, who I really loved. Um, saw Joanna went uh and then we fell in with bands like Monitor and the Human Hands and that th their singer was also from Phoenix but uh truly once I got into LA um yeah I was just a kid when I was listening to this stuff and I thought that punk rock was the greatest thing in the world I wanted to like you know run away and join the circus and <laughs> once I got to, to Los Angeles and met a lot of these people I realized that um they were they didn't live up to my fantasies and I also realized that I didn't live up to my fantasies, which is to say, I have never been addicted to junk. I have, you know, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, neither have we. <laughs> I can, can drink about one beer before it's all. And I just found that once I got to LA, I said, oh, these people party a lot harder than I do. Well, you know, and then when we ran into the boys from SST, they really didn't party. Uh, we They made, you know, we made them Though they made us look like hard partiers because we like to smoke pot and take acid, but we were not into, you know, you know, doing it to excess or anything like that. So uh, we were just a couple of, you know, a handful of suburban boys um, trying to like live up to, you know, how it is. I mean, maybe you don't know how it is because you live in big the <laughs> city, but in Phoenix, it's all about like, you know, living up to the fantasy you have of the the real world or whatever. And uh, it was, uh, you know, we, we our our uh, expectations for ourselves in the world was really high, and it wasn't until we uh, got into it that we discovered, <laughs> like, well, you know, people used to, you know, you get into weird um, polit the politics of the scene, 
and um, you discover that whereas my reason for doing it was elevated, you know, and artistic and all that stuff. Some people just like to get down. Some people just liked to, um, I don't know, have sex. And I, I uh, <laughs> never. Uh... So, you know, no. Uh, so, you know, we, we, <laughs> yeah. we uh, were pretty popular right out of the, the, the shoot. People so who... was there a lot of sex with your popularity? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, Jesus. all right, then. <laughs> I mean, they're Kirk, not too Kirk, exclusive. Kirk was uh, was an extremely good looking young fellow. Hey, back so then. were you. I mean, you, so were you. You're still pretty cute there, honey. But you were really, there. really cute. Yeah, I was. I was awfully cute back then. Now I'm uh, pretty cute. Struggling to keep a keep a, a toe hold like the rest of us. But yeah, we were good looking guys, and we can't. You know, it's like any um any uh new. It was like three. You know, good looking available guys hit the scene, and there was definitely um. You know, for the five uh, available women uh, in the uh, scene the size of Phoenix, I'm sure that we managed. Well, to... well f five women and three guys sounds like a party to me. That's right. We have to switch off or fight. <laughs> well, so so what about, you know, we're talking about people who are more your age and when the punk L.A. scene was coming around. What about your home hero, town hero, Alice Cooper? I mean, oh, he's still around. He's, well, he's, he's still around. But, but was this a big influence on you guys? Alice oh. Cooper likes to do Christmas shows. Eh, no, but we're talking well, the early I'm, 70s I'm when talking you were about just a young rep scout. Alice, Alice we, likes to wear the Santa cap. <laughs> Look, yes, Al no, Alice, no. Alice is one of the biggest disappointments of my rock life because I loved 73 Alice Cooper. I loved everything until Billion Dollar Babies. I really did. Uh, yeah, well, I, that was I wasn't really into to hard rock in the in the in, in, during his time. I mean, I remember when school, Schools Out came out, and I was like, "Oh, that's a good song." But I didn't get in. I didn't even get into the Rolling Stones until after I got into punk. Punk rock was the first hard rock music okay. that I felt was like something I wanted to get involved in. So no, I didn't pay much attention to him <laughs> paid more attention to the tubes because i was a little bit more attuned to the hippie thing <laughs> i went and saw the tubes in a blizzard in buffalo once it was oh, a good tell time. me that story the other night so it was what, a how, good time yeah how how old were you when you first experimented with uh psychedelics 14 14 was that lsd yeah Okay, and that was real LSD. I was like the, the real deal. That's when the good shit yeah. was around. I think that if you start like I did with mescaline or LSD or psychedelics, it actually you don't have to become a, a junkie of the really devastating crap because you've already been expanded and you know what oh, yeah. really what the expansion of drugs can do without yeah, that, going that, into the my fucking mind, head. Oh. My mind was good and blown by the time I uh, graduated yeah. from high school. Good and As, blown. By the time I heard punk rock. I was like, oh my God. I was just the the the, the level of uh um Dionysian abandon just really <laughs> me. And it's like when when and then the meat puppets were all about that. It was like my I was a very rudimentary drummer. Very not uh, I mean you had a band that was very simple uh when you were starting out, at least when I first heard you. Oh, one drum and one cymbal, honey. Right. Come on. Yeah, I wasn't it's, it's hard to play that, that shit. <laughs> but that was the kind of stuff I was really into. So I really, what I wanted to do is be the the wind up doll from hell that just like pounded the crap out of stuff. And we started off learning, um, you know, punk rock covers and stuff, and then started writing our our own songs. And it was always about, um, it wasn't like harder, faster, louder, like hardcore. It was just like, how out of your fucking mind can you get? And when we hit the stage, oh man, I would just bleed. It was great. <laughs> I mean. It was it was just unbelievable when you could catch catch a, a, a good crowd and you could really go nuts. And I mean, a good crowd, not one that's with you, one that's like completely <laughs> confused. Then you just just spurned on to be a crazy. It's like once we got again, once we hit the scene, people started to get to know us. You know, it was like, eh, God, I need to uh, get away from these people. And I stopped wanting to hang out uh, in on the scene and stuff. And then fortunately, we had an opportunity to play. Uh, um nationally we did our first tour in 82 and it was just like 25 dollars and a floor to sleep on be, you know with, with 800 miles in between it was rough and uh, who, who, who booked that first tour god i can't uh, his, his name was um Gr 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 Grimelsky, Grelsky, uh, chris gremsky chris gremsky he was from new york 
And who are his other bands? Like, why did you go to this guy? Or why did this guy go I to I have you? absolutely no idea. I, I think it's probably because SST put us onto him because they probably used him. You know, Black Flag had done several national tours by that time, but they didn't yet have their own uh, booking agency together, which they eventually did once um, Chuck moved out, out from behind the base and behind the desk and started running their their booking operations. So they probably um, had worked with Black Flag. And he was out of New York and... Uh, he really blew my mind because we got to New York and we were still, you know, we still had to get all the way home. And he insisted on getting paid in full. And um, I was pissed. I was just like, well, fine. You know, hopefully, hopefully we won't uh, be found dead on the side of a road somewhere. Uh, by the way, I was talking to James Faherty, you know, from Orlando, Florida, and he booked the Meat Puppets a few times. And he was sending his regards about the devastation of your shows in Orlando. In those early right. days, I'd love, love to love to go back. I, I spent some time. My wife's from Florida, so I spent a decent amount of time there, and uh, they like to party there. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Well, there's a big exhibit at the Orlando History Museum of all the things that Figurehead did, which was James Faherty of all. I mean, he booked three thousand shows. So yeah. posters. I'm sure you're I'm sure there's posters of the Meat Puppets up. I'll be down there at the end of January performing. So anyway, shout outs from him. Because I'm, and this was, I think, in the heyday of your probably yeah, uh, very interesting lifestyle on the road. We got, uh, you know, by the time, you know, 1990 you rolled around, a lot of your, and your band started getting signed by your major labels. Uh, it became harder and harder to, to work, uh, just not only because, you know, you know how the, the independent uh, things would, would uh, work, especially with SST. You know, there may be, be a half dozen artists that would sell, but SST would put out like, 57 releases and so you know your tent pole artists that sell would pretty much prop up the whole distribution thing and by the time the 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 the, the uh the majors started sniffing around um and pulling those tent poles out of the scene it became uh, harder and harder to get your records distributed and then we would be um doing these shows and the bands that would be opening for us would be on majors and they have all this these fuckers blowing smoke up their ass and we'd be doing our own driving and our records would barely be in the in the stores and theirs would be all over the place and they'd be doing all this press. So finally, we just said, fuck it. And um, we took the plunge and it wasn't super easy to get people interested in um, a band as uh, as uh, blatantly uncommercial as us. But, you know, 1990 after obviously after Nirvana, we got signed in 90. So it was before. Never mind. But um you know, it's, it's, we we found that um, you know at least I certainly found, and uh, I was I witnessed it. Uh, even if the other guys wouldn't admit it, it's rough going when you're trying to deal with majors and you're trying to deal with uh, their inputs. And um, I remember we had a devil of a time trying to find a producer for the first major label record we did, and they put us together with Pete Anderson, who worked with Dwight Yoakam. Oh my god! Oh. Like, okay, well, you guys are going to make us a country band we actually had gotten interest from like david briggs and that was like the level that was what what they how they had us pigeonholed and um uh, pete anderson come out to see us play a show where at least one of us was dosed i don't think i was, but I was <laughs> and it was fucking great it was unbelievable um not only were we like lightning fast and uh, amazing um, you know, I'm seeing the video, uh, you know, now I'm just like gobsmacked, but we ended it with like this 20 minute noise jam of insanity and screaming <laughs> into the mic and like dancing around and playing like, you know, you know, monsters on, you know, becoming um, <laughs> manifesting the whole thing. And, you know, here's our uh, producer whose job it is to like clean us up and, and present us to the, the American public. And he's just like going, it's no wonder you guys uh, and I'm like <laughs> yeah. and he tried to put us put us through the ringer and we had to like set him down and even still it was like he um auto-tuned all of our vocals and uh yeah and it was, it's a great album I mean it was um which album was that this was Forbidden Places okay. the one from 91 and it's one of my favorites I like it better than the one that everybody likes which is um Too High to Die which was another huge fight to get made by the, the label who wanted us to do songs we didn't want to do. I mean, can, if you can believe, I mean, you know, 1994, now it seems like, well, duh, but I felt like it was, you know, 1965. And they're like trying to pick our songs for us. And we're just like, 
we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot until we get to move forward on our own two feet. Um, eventually, the record came out, and lo and behold, um, they were able to leverage um, Nirvana's popularity to squeak us by. Um, and you know how it is with the majors. Um, they go out on a limb for you. They got to call in favors and stuff. So they are going to be make damn sure that at least they get off the hook. And so they got their right. gold out of us. And then it was like too big to fail. Yeah, right. Exactly. Too big. Too to hard to die. <laughs> by the way, Dwight, Dwight. By the way, Dwight Yoakam, a better actor than a musician, really good in Sling Blade, <laughs> the Billy Bob Thornton film, which got his career going. If you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. Oh, I saw Sling Blade oh. in the uh, in the theaters. Oh, it's um, grand. Yeah. Also, really good at at um, uh, pretending to be a country artist. Well, oh. We should just stick to acting. He's a perfect sleaze bag for all that. <laughs> he just looks good in a pair of tight jeans. He looks good with a cowboy hat. Don't show me that fading hairline and stop playing that music. He'll be all good, baby. Did you get into uh, tech? Were you always into kind of into computers and technology, or is that something that came later? I, I bought my first Macintosh uh, in 1994. Okay. With um with all the money I saved from my per diems by touring <laughs> with um Stone Temple Pilots for ten weeks, and um what were we the per were, diems? What were the per diems for a Stone Temple Pilots tour? Twenty five bucks a day, man. Ah, oh, okay. Not, not to mention the fact that there's a feast backstage and and comped meals for every every night. So I just like brought a big um bag with me and shoved uh food into it, saved the money, and um. My neighbor was wanted to upgrade to a, a better computer, and so I bought like a old an old a Macintosh. I still have, and um, took, they took work. A, they work. Know. They work. They work until they die. They're amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, I hate to promote, but it's true. I have some that are oh, 15 years old. It still works. Yeah. No. I uh, I for some reason uh, got into it, and it was a good thing I did, since uh, being the meat puppets didn't really pay, especially if you're the drummer. And uh, so I was oh, able. So to, like, is that is, is that because of was there publishing issues or, or like why were you paid different than the other two guys? Because the that we never made any money except for from publishing issues, specifically from three little songs which happened to appear on a record that sold probably forty five times more than our entire catalog ever did. Okay, and, and what was what was what was the deal? Because that was on a major label, right? So, well, this is the the uh, the uh, the Nirvana Unplugged record allowed us to like get off the road because uh, there was such a windfall from that, from be it from the publishing and and the mechanicals from being on that. So those guys were on it. They weren't just um, they didn't just cover songs on it. They were actually on it. So it was a it was our our payday for like fifteen years of slogging through. And yeah. what, what people don't really realize is like they think that if they're a band that they've heard of and that has influenced people and has been going for so long that you must have a lot of money. It's not freaking true. Well, they also <laughs> think we book the shows that we own the clubs and, and yeah. uh, that, <laughs> we, that we write our own uh, uh, press. Um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's, yeah, it's not enough that you run you that you've been running the Meat Puppets website says like 95. I mean, people just I mean, the amount of influence or or, or mouth service that people have has nothing to do with their bank accounts. Just understand that. And 15 years, 20 years, 30 years on the road don't mean nothing except you're a road doggy. Well, let's put it this way. There are tons of things that you and I could uh, actually share with the public, teach the public, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. But those are the things they don't want to hear about. Well, that's why when anybody asks me, what do you, what's your suggestion for, you know, young musicians i'm like become an architect or chemist yeah, right. doctor we need right. more learn, better drugs Hello. learn how to bag groceries um <laughs> go work at a grocery store and keep a gun in your car for when the crazies come and you need to barricade yourself in with the food <laughs> um, it's so, coming uh, it's here it's now it's coming hello yeah right. well coming. so so if you guys you know were not huge part of your types but who did lots of acid compared to the LA punk scene besides the SSC, SST straight well, edge boys. Was, I, I, Derek, I don't know. Derek, Derek was, was it? Derek he, stands you know, well. <laughs> that was in the eighties. Obviously um, our poor bass player uh, did, did it, got, had some catching up to do and he managed yeah. to uh, get himself into a little bit of trouble. He's fine now. But was, we, don't we, have, was, we, don't have to go, we don't have to go into that. No, but, but what I would, but, but what I want to get at is, is, 
was the commercial success? Unfortunately, it wasn't personal. That's that's the problem. It got uh, published. Oh, no, a lot. Yeah, of course. But we don't need to retrash that. No, no but, but what, what, what I'm getting at is, was the commercial success, or at least the perceived commercial success, parallel with the consumption, the consumption, yeah. the 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 counterbalance through imbibing substances to the the tsunami of of viewers of uh there's there's, there's a couple of of of, of, of par parts to that first of all you're working like crazy like yeah. we had a record that was um that we you know we were trying to promote and it was successful so we worked like fiends you know we were like um you know playing in la one night and playing in new york the next night by red eye and stuff like that and um traveling a lot i mean we i took a i flew like once a week on on the average in 1994 we all did um so we had a ton of work to do lots of driving and you get into town and the local um you know label rep is there who's trying to like party with the band or they've invited a bunch of people to the show and they expect to be serviced by the band who are going to party with them and i'd always like my, make myself scarce and i remember one morning uh kurt woke up uh and he was obviously he'd been kept up all night by these fuckers and he's like bossum you need to start staying at these parties i can't do all the part i can't party uh you know these, uh, and these are just label people. These are the people who supposedly have a vested interest in our success. They're just dragging us down. But what they really want is the boxes of promos, which they go and sell to the local record store. Ah. And that's how they make their bones. So um, I found the whole scene to be extremely parasitic. Um, and, um, you know, in 1994, there was just like, set them up and knock them down. You know, how many of these uh, alternative bands came around? Uh, got their day in the sunshine and then crashed and burned. And unfortunately, um, while none of us died, um, I, honestly, I wanted, I was, I was so, so fed up with, uh, with the bullshit and the way they treated us after, you know, we had given them their gold record. And then the next record, they just like shafted it. They didn't do anything with it. And uh, was there, was there a reason why they did shaft it? Well, because the next big thing was right around the corner, corner, man. We were, we were, we were, we were, we were headed, we were all headed to O-Town. You remember uh, the boy bands? Oh, oh, oh okay, okay, okay. All right, right. Yeah, I mean, well, that's going back to Orlando. That's uh... we went from we went from um, you know all uh, from grunge to Spice World in a couple of uh, uh, cycles. Oh, well, uh, well, 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 actually, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. All of us bands that they were trying to gravy train on us, we were all came up on our own, right? We were rough. We wanted to do things our way. We were not pliant, and eventually. There were bands that came up. Um, the, the you know the next wave of the alternative rockers were more pliant, right? And obviously, Stone and they, and they weren't alternative. They called it alternative rock, but they well, weren't I, alternative. I can't. You know, I I had journalists um, um, hang hang me up by my uh, by my words in in the in uh, in in press before. In fact, we had a situation where I did an interview to promote the Stone Table Pilots tour. And the uh, interviewer obviously was really into the puppets and really hated STP. And so in the midst of this interview, you know, that I did, it was basically a, a hit piece on them. They okay. noted it. <laughs> uh, yeah. not particularly pleasant. Um, then those guys are still good friends with us. Um, those guys um, reintroduced the, the, the meat puppets uh, when Chris and Kurt got back together. They uh, they came up on stage during a Stone Temple pilot show and God, they uh, let us come along on the, the biggest tour of the of the year. You know, we had the opportunity of touring 10 weeks with a band that had a number one record, but it was they partied. Um, well, Scott Weiland, I mean, he of course, he partied literally, literally, literally to death. And yeah, did you go to death and my poor bass player got got into it on that level as well. And it um, but the thing is, is like. You know, you, you see that not a lot of bands get to see that, especially bands that started the way we did. And, you know, if you listen to our first record and figure, you know, in in 15 years, we're going to be, uh, you know, on a number one tour of the United States. You just wouldn't be able to, to square it. So we got to see uh, see the cool stuff. And I remember, you know, it's like all these little girls, like teenage preteen girls would come up and they would, you know, they would ask me questions like, do you know, Courtney? <laughs> and uh, and you know the whole and then you know um the nirvana <laughs> lounge during the whole period um it was just it was it was weird to see 
you know, how my feeling about my art, my music, whatever, is that it's mine. You know, I'm going to make it what it is. I'm going to be the one that has to do it. It's going to be on my terms as much as I possibly can. And I'll be a dick about it. I was a dick about it to my own band when I when there was a conflict, um, you know, but, you know, it's understood. But when you get out into the world where people are like actually, you know, they, you know, they're just like robber barons. Uh, I couldn't have um, I couldn't have been more put out. And, um, well, and also there was like, you know, the heyday of MTV where bands like Stone Temple Pilots were in rotation as well. And, and, and it was just a money game. It was a money grab. It was an intellectual grab. Like who's going to stick next? I mean, obviously nobody ever had tried to approach me from a fucking major record label. Well, right. Like, I by the look on my face, <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Well, I was just going to say, um, I don't want to come off as disingenuous. Obviously, we uh, used to hide behind the mantle of a pretty square, um, you know, uh, you know, our, our shows would get wild, but our records were as normal as we could make them. And um, it wasn't that we, um, I mean, I never really wanted to quote unquote sell out, whatever the fuck that means. Yeah, but it wasn't selling, it wa but it wasn't selling out. No, it's, no, it's selling it's, up and it's, you know, you well, get it's just part of the journey. You take out your opportunity and you do whatever you can with it. It's fun. It's interesting. And you get to travel and you get to make sounds and um and then you, you realize then you realize what a crock of shit it is and you go back yeah. to doing what you always did, which is what we still do. This is what I what we're doing now. Which um, is what you're doing now. So let's talk the, about the here and now. What we're, which is to say we're paying to play like it should be. <laughs> so, so are you so you took you know the band took a, hi, a couple of hiatuses. You yeah. took one from even a band like reunion. Years. Yeah. Yeah. Um was that, uh, did that feel like a vacuum? I mean, if you if you go, even no matter where your headspace is, no matter what your perception is, if you're doing 52 flights a year with a million miles of driving in between, that has an impact on just your your, sense, your senses in general, no matter what you, where you're, wherever your perception is on what you want to be. Just that, putting the brakes on that. What was what was how did that feel for you at that point? The last couple of years of doing it, uh, or uh, Kurt Kurt once referred to it as the the the, the lost years, and there was a you you're know, talking about the after ninety five, like around then or when? No, before like ninety three, ninety four, okay. ninety five. Yeah. Um, when we were like playing the game, and um, kind of had lost contact with the kind of the reasons we were doing it, which was you know because it was it was a slog. It was like you know when you're. I tell you, when you're open for a band like Stone Temple Pilots, the 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 there's a there's a desire to play good music, but you also got people standing at the side of the road, the side of the stage going, yeah. and uh, you need to make sure you're off off stage on time, and that becomes your the main focus of your day is getting off in 40 minutes and not 40 minutes in one second. It yeah. can fuck up the music. It can fuck up your, yeah. your focus. And um, I'm the kind of guy. Who's just gonna go, like go and um, just turn my back? You know, it just became like <laughs> you know, uh, just like not a pleasant to be around. Not you know, go, just kind of ghosting it. And uh, eventually, I uh, uh, just kind of kind of vanished. And um, you know, Kurt had he was he was getting a lot more smoke blowing up his ass than I was, obviously, because he was the leader. He was the focus and. Um, and uh, meanwhile, his brother was um, was partying too hard and stuff. So we all just kind of went. Um, I mean, first of all, is it weird to be in such a small unit where two are brothers and then you are the outsider anyway, even if you're one of the founding members? I mean, yeah, it kind of yeah. it kind of sucks because then it becomes more about the family and less about the music sometimes. And uh, to my to my to my way of thinking, um, now that we have Ron in the band. Um, Oh, and, two, let's, and let's talk about Ron Sabinski for a while because you know, now. I just adore this man. The first time I met him, which I think might have been at Kevin Shea's house, who's now drumming yeah. with Retrovirus, I just loved him immediately. And He's I didn't funny. know anything about him. I mean, I, I know that Tim knew him for quite a while, and but I knew nothing about him except the something about this guy that is just spectacular. He's very open. You know, he's open and he's in the moment. He's kind of a nut. Um, he's definitely a lifer, which is to say he absolutely plays all the time. He's going out with, God, I can't remember, never can keep all of his bands straight. But, uh, but how know, did he get into the meat puppet? Yeah, how did you guys meet? Uh, he started hanging out with, uh, he started coming to the shows and 
you know, for the same reason you love him and you noticed right away that you loved him. So did those guys. And um, it was just a question. Uh, honestly, Chris was really impressed with him and he pestered Kurt until he said he um, let um, Kurt invite him over to his house and they got together and started jamming and stuff. Uh, there's not that many people who we can tolerate around. And uh, even he, he's pretty knowledgeable for, you know, he can kind of. Um, oh, he, he, he was, for the listeners who don't know Ron Zeminski, he was, I met him when I was 12 years old. And I was saying earlier before we were recording this, he was ripping through Chopin and Franz Liszt at and age 12. A, I mean, on a, piano. He's a bit of an idiot savant, which is what, what's fun about him. But he's, he's also a good, uh, he's also a good uh, French horn player at the time. But yes, I, I know. <laughs> I know. You had uh, his French horn uh, um, patron on uh, on show number, I think, 44. <laughs> uh, but uh, but um, the thing is, is, Ron is really into, um, you know, free jazz. Uh, oh, and, yeah. uh, nor, you know, he's not a traditional like noise musician like a lot of people you know and even kevin shea he kind of a noise guy in a lot of ways he plays you know he, he was talking about on your show about how he is uh influenced by animal on uh on the muppets muppets it's right funny his, his, mouth into... his mouth trumpet record that he's finishing please i yeah. have no idea it, it, it's funny <laughs> i got into the drums because i used to, from watching the banana splits so it's not that ah. funny um because i'm a little older than he is but uh, <laughs> but you know ron will play he, he'll actually do like you know all these sets at the holiday inn on the on the freeway he's nuts he plays anything he's a professional he's a professional musician and i i, I kind of can relate on other many levels <laughs> yeah which is to say by the way congratulations on your new record tim uh, which one? The, the, the solo I know. one? You're probably one of those guys who puts uh, out three more records at a time. Uh, the the pulverized one is the one. Oh, I, oh, you checked it out. I appreciate that. Well, yeah, I like to check out what Peter does. I had that was my first introduction to Peter yeah. Evans. Peter Evans, yeah, yeah that, that that's a pretty psychedelic record. I appreciate that you checked that out. Um, yeah, so I mean, the question is, you like Ron? Ron's a, not just a, a great musician, great pianist. He's also a music scholar. He's he, he lives it. He Did you guys? Drugs. He does not use drugs. He never has. I, well, I, I'm a, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of I that. I don't use them anymore either. Well, I I mean, he's also. I'm waiting. Some... How about some new drugs? That's why I I say don't become a musician. We need better drugs. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> Well, would, it's a renaissance right now for psychedelics. That's a whole other conversation. I say, yeah, I, I and I I'm happy to to participate in that in that. Uh, in that um re renaissance uh, myself but i you know i'm like i said to ron i said ron i want you to nod your head now say the word yes <laughs> yes okay that means that you have agreed that at any time i can dose you ah, nice. <laughs> but you know that is uh, well it's funny i'm not going to throw anyone here under the bus but i've heard similar uh, okay, I know, 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 hang on, I'm going to admit this. On stage in the past, with another amazing drummer who I've played with, Ian White, who was in my band, Big Sexy Noise, and he's a great solo musician, I once turned to him and said, open your mouth. He said, what? Yeah. In the middle of a set, in the middle of a set, he said, eat this, tab of ecstasy. <laughs> I'm not going to sing another word. He had to. Well, that's cool. I mean, I'm going to do that to Ron, see, well, in the middle, well, of, a, in middle of a set. Well, Lydia, we did mushrooms mid set uh, in oh, front yes. of people, and and that that always because it's not you're not peaking, but it's swelling as the set's kind of coming, and that's a you whole thing. Timing is everything. Yes. Timing, timing is so, everything. It's so wonderful. It's so. I mean, my mind works really fast anyway, and when I'm on stage <laughs> I'm lit, I'm just like. And there's five of us. Like there used to be three of us. It was an intense, focused, little crazy trio. Now there's five of us. I'm just like sparking off everybody going, whoa, 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 whoa. It's great. It's so great. besides so, besides uh, Ron, who else is in the no, band? I wanted one question. I wanted one question. Did you like Ron and said, we need a place for him? Or were you looking for keyboards and he just happened to come your way? Or did he insert himself? I think that anytime we create a project, I mean, I, I only did the, the last album with them. Uh, I restart, rejoined in like 2018. But from what I can tell, after every record, and, and it, it, you know, kind of goes its its way, then there's that crisis as to like, God, are we ever going to do another one? No, maybe, I don't know. And Curtis is like, Ugh. 
And so I think that a lot of um, what got what what helped uh, get Ron into it was uh, Kurt was looking for um, a little bit of a of a of a creative uh, spark, um, something, and he was interested in the keyboards because he'd heard Ron's uh, solo stuff and he was intrigued. And um, you know, it's Kurt has a thing about um, about Kurt is if you've uh, ever seen him during his heyday, which ain't anymore but when we were younger he could play the fuck out of some guitar and i'm not just talking about Jimi hendrix shit or whatever or rush or whatever which he could also but he's a fucking crazy fucker who plays a lot of different very diverse it's obvious with his mind you know he's very trippy um but his fingers aren't what they were when he was 25 so the idea he brought his son along his son is a great guitar player and also a total fucking freak and uh, to bring in Ron just allows us to like indulge our Tom Petty fantasies, our Grateful Dead fantasies, whatever, and just play like a larger ensemble with a bigger palette. And um, I mean, fun, fun, ult fun. It ultimately, it has to be a positive experience. Jesus Christ. I mean, my my life, I'm sure as as yours is, Lydia, is there's plenty of things. I heard your news segments on some of your episodes. You like to wallow in negativity as much <laughs> as I do, but that's only because you've experienced the ultimate positivity, which is making your fucking art in front of fucking people. And I'm um, very, I'm extremely positive. I'm just there to call it as I see it. That's yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. Likewise. I mean, that's it. And you know, I, I mean, Tim will tell you, I'm one of the most positive people he knows. Tim will tell you. It sounds like a good T-shirt. Well, well, you know, or or like a well, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, if you're up in the morning, no, if you're up in the morning, if you're participating, if you're up in the morning you're, and you're contributing, um, that is positive, even if the content's negative. Well, or and, if it's no, positive, no, and, it and by matter. the way, I don't feel it's my I don't feel it's my job to illustrate the positive because you can paint a happy picture on a piece of shit. That's not my job. My job is to just underline the issues. I'm not a solutionist. I'm an apocalyptician. That's what I've always been. It's what I will continue to be. So well, it's got to be the woman with a bullhorn on the top of the mountain. Let's yeah. not also forget how fucking hilarious humans are. The, the idiots. Myself the, the, included. The, the, the trouble that people get into that you read about constantly is just... I it's, love it. It's, it's endless. Hey, as a tech guy, what do you, what do you believe in the, the physicist theory that... We're all just a computer simulation. Do you like that, that oh, theory? I, I don't. I don't think we're a computer simulation. <laughs> I think that we're um, uh, unable to perceive um, a a a uh, an objective reality, as it were, because there's no such thing. Right. So um, you know, I don't think we've. Uh, I, I think we spend most, if not all, of our time uh, on, on on Earth wasted. I think it, it is it, our time is wasted. I think that when you uh, make music with people on stage with in front of people, um, it gets as, it's about as close as I've come to what I would like to consider reality. But that's just what I would like to consider reality. Um, if but I that, that, that's hyper presence uh, and it maybe touches yeah. our primal, which is just yeah. microsecond to microsecond. Every action's important and it's not looking forward or back. It's in the fucking well, moment. For for me though, um, as somebody who started off um, with you know the whole. Uh, Sears drum kit mentality. Um, <laughs> I spent a lot of my uh, my formative years as a musician feeling reasonably um, unconfident in my skills, and it took me until a long time to realize that you can just fucking go for it. Right, and, but but that was a, a wonderful, beautiful gift that I gave to myself when I learned it. Um, and it, well, uh, it's also letting go. If it, it, it's funny, you right. say this. It's, it's funny, you say this. Go. It's funny, you say this. Uh, I, I, uh, Derek, I was at uh, Mars Fest, which is the big, biggest, maybe German avant-garde festival, and and we were us playing. But in the, during the day, they 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 do these random groups that they select, they curate of improv. Yeah, I've heard about some of these things. And, and, and so I was with Ron Stavinsky, who I I you know I hadn't seen for years. Like I, I did run into him through Kevin J, and I was with um, Willie Wynette, the the brilliant. Uh, uh, Percussionist. Percussion. Percussion. Anyhow, I said I said to Ron because it, it's relating to what you're saying about feeling maybe not up to par with what your brain wants you to be. I said to Ron, I "Go when I met you at 12 years old, you were the best child musician I had ever met." And I was at music camp with you, and in that music camp, there's probably about 400 kids. I was probably the worst one there. Where's everyone else right now in this moment? 
for me, it was just like, oh, right. All I have to do, first of all, musicians are assholes. All I have to do is practice. That's easy. That's the easy part. Practice. But it's also surrendering and saying, hey, just follow well, me. And that, and that comes from the other part of practice, which is even harder to do because it's harder to realize you have to do it. You have to practice listening. And uh, that was all, all the above. 95% of it for me. Or, or doing it. Like you, as you were saying, you were doing a million shows at one point. At some point, if you're doing a million oh, yeah. shows oh, yeah. on stage, turns it's out great. you can just do it. Yep. It's just, and it's great because what I discovered also is that, you know, you're like, you get to be a certain age and you go on tour and you're like, oh, I'll be tired. I'll be sick. I won't get enough sleep. I'll eat a bunch of crap, whatever. And I found that the worse I feel, the less sleep, the worse food, the more oh. driving, the better the music is because A, I want it more, but also I'm unable, this has, can't work it, <sighs> you know? No, I, no Derek, Tim's, Derek. Tim, Tim's applauding because no. he's in that position quite often. On no, 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 but Derek, no, but Derek, because I was asking myself, I had a moment where I was like, I'll have to do, I'll be in a bunch of groups. So I, it's like, okay, it's <laughs> right now, right now it's like holiday season, but then it, it's like, Fall and spring are the big touring seasons. And it's like, oh, I got five tours in a row coming up. And and on the eve, I'll find myself staying up all night, maybe getting plastered. I'm like, why am I doing this on the eve? And I was like, I think subconsciously, I, I want to be the dumbest I can possibly be, which is like the only energy I have is to get me through this, this moment. It's you'll like, play crap. If your brain gets in the way, you'll play crap. If you can... You're, I mean, that's why we're meat puppets is because we realized that, um, you know, we had to let go and, and let the let the, the the art play us, whatever. But um, so Derek, let, let me ask you this. Once I can contribute consciously to the music, the less I'm going to listen that's, back to it and think that I sucked. That, because yeah, I've I heard those theories. That's funny. Anyway. It, it, getting a little, you know, if you're Lydia is like, because sometimes we'd have people complaining like oh this wasn't perfect that lydia's always like rock and roll's pretty dumb and yeah. uh and and what are you crying about and so sometimes there if you're maybe no, i'm not striving for perfection i'm striving for an an impacting experience oh yeah for me i like the, uh, i know i, like I know the... what i know what impregnates people and it's not every note play, being played perfect necessarily i also like the notion i like to play around with the idea of the of the natural friction between the artist and the the uh the audience because at the end of the day it's like i really question their reason to be there you know it's always like, I've, I've seen people show up <laughs> For no fucking reason, in my opinion. Well, this is how much of a dick I am, Derek. Is when people go, "Oh, I really like your music," and this is something that you, I could imagine you saying. I'm like, which music? Yeah. I mean, what period? What era? You can't oh, I tell know. me well, you like yeah, I've been all around of it. for long enough. There's only one you know? record that anybody of, that we ever did that anybody likes, and it's from a long time ago. Um, well, when people used to uh, um, compliment Kurt on the sh on the show, he used to say, or in the early days, he'd say. Well, you heard it. He wouldn't take any credit for it at all. <laughs> well, there those, you those go. days when we were just so high and we'd come off stage and be just, like, when I got back into the band in, in 2000, we did this show, this one off show in 2017 because we'd been inducted into a Phoenix Hall of <laughs> Fame thing. And um, I was really put off by it. I was like, this sucks. And then I heard from the grapevine um, that they really didn't want to do without me. And I talked to Kurt and he w w thought it was as big a pile of shit as I, I, I did. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. And then right before the show, and I don't smoke weed anymore. It gets me really oh, it's too, high. it's too much, I know. It's, and and somebody handed me one of these uh, gizmos that the, these these crazy the vapes. The vapes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I tried to be polite, just kind of touch it. And it got me so fucking high. I was like, this is it. I'm like, I've gotten to this moment and I can't even remember how one gets to the stage. And I'm not talking about, <laughs> talking about in a totally metaphysical sense. How does one get practically to get stage to the stage? <laughs> where one can get to a stage? And it's like asking people like, so do you know when I'm supposed to go on? Is it like this second? That's or the funny. Second? And uh, I thought, oh, this is going to suck. And I got on stage and I sat down and we started playing. And I could feel the music coming up through the floor. And I hadn't done it in like 20 years, literally. And I could feel these 
sympathetic feelings that I hadn't felt for so many years that were so familiar to me. And I found myself, my, I left my body. And I was sitting in the front row watching it. And um, I was like, fuck this. I'm going to get back into this. And uh, nice. Ooh. Oh, amazing. Yes. Um, and you, you, you say uh, kids, um, you know, stick to bag and groceries. Uh, but the truth is, it's like, if there are any young people out there, and I know you have a lot of young people in your audience, Lydia. Are there any young <laughs> well, they're younger than us, I guess, most of them, but whatever. Yeah. I used to be the baby. Now I'm just the baby <laughs> yeah, mama. Right, yeah. uh, when, if you're like actually trying to chase something that's fucking cool and beyond yourself and b bigger than you and bigger than anything else, go for it. But if you want to be like this, I saw this, saw this fucking thing on uh PBS about TikTok the other night, and they have these fucking P these attention whores that think that that the world is celebrity, and they like do. This is one guy was doing beatbox shit, another guy was doing like Michael Jackson dance moves, and his dad is managing his like Adidas oh. sponsorships, and I'm like, for fucking TikTok, are you fucking kidding me? You'll never know what it's like to like. I mean, fucking, I'll tell you what you do. Take some fucking mushrooms and turn your phone on yourself. And if you can figure out where the start button is, see how many fucking followers you can lose and then come back. And, <laughs> and if you're looking for followers, that's the worst reason oh, to yeah, start to do doing it for the anything. Lols, it's Hello. You know, you do it because if you don't, your blood boils. You don't yeah, do exactly. it for likes, loves, you're, money, you're fame. All that shit is 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 irrelevant and it goes away real quick. I so know, and I say this, and you say it like an author authority, and I agree with you. But that's like we're like one point you know, point zero zero one percent of the artists good, out there. Good enough Most odds for the fucking laws. Good enough odds for me. Yeah. So one percent. I'm the we're the zero 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 point one percent. Well, that's where I like to remain. They pay yeah, publicists. They like, they they pay certain certain celebrities pay publicists six figures <laughs> for the laws. I mean, I mean <laughs> and it's just and that's fine you know everybody's got to make a living go for it i'm an old man i don't get to decide what people in their teens get to do any more than people who are old got to decide what i was going to do but i don't fucking think that what i'm chasing could be found there and i i do you know social media for the band and um people suck i mean during the pandemic I know <laughs> it's like I've discovered, you know how like on Facebook, there's like events, which are like things, oh, yeah, on, they're like dots, uh, ones and zeros that they claim to be actual events, except for they're not, they're ones and zeros. And they're just ads for a show. And it's like, we're not going to the shows. The shows are canceled. You know, the world is shutting down. And like the promoters left these things up and they wouldn't cancel them. They wouldn't cancel the shows. They would only postpone them. So because, ripping people off, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So, you so, so you're basically saying you're basically saying uh, cancel culture was misdirected in that case. <laughs> no, I'm saying that the audiences <laughs> were getting ripped off, and of I course, actually of went course. and I deleted all of the events from our Facebook page, and it it uh, it caused an uproar amongst the 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 promoters that were out there saying we don't have the money to give these people their money back. Oh, this yeah. show is canceled. It's postponed. I'm like, yeah, but I don't want your you you're advertising a show that's not going to happen and you're not taking it down and I don't want it on my social media site because people are on there going, "Well, I guess the meat puppets are the good ones. They're not canceling their shows." I'm like, "Oh fuck." And then um you know, we, we do these postpone these these tour. We did we were going to do a tour with um Mud Honey and um it that was, good, Bill. was we played with them yes yeah. we know about well them. it was postponed except for we did why well, when we redid the show it was rerouted to completely different cities so all these people who weren't getting refunds right were not going to they were going to see a mud honey show right. but we weren't on it and um it's a scam and, and then wow. and then there's all these people who who blame me personally right exactly because, That's how it goes. because the club has a you know, a health policy. It's like, well, well, look, I, okay, I, I'm going gonna, gonna to settle it right now. I'm going to look at it this way. They paid $20 and they're not getting a live concert. You got so much shit on fucking line. You have so much stuff for, for sale. Everything's up on YouTube. Go watch an hour of some shit. For free. That you've already done for free and stop crying about $20 donation to a band who didn't even get the money anyway. Yeah, right. Well, and then they're also complaining that we're, um, you know, because the club is insisting that people uh, wear a mask or have a, a, a negative test, that it's somehow 
we have anything to do with it and that we're disrupting the community because of the club's policy. You know what? I think that all, all, all men should wear burkas. Everybody should be in a hazmat suit, double bag it. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Don't blame the band for what's been happening. Leave us the fucking loan. We're doing the best we can do. This is the Lydian spin with Tim Dahl. And thank you so much, Derek. I don't even know what else to say, except we're not going to stop. So fuck right. all y'all. That's it. Keep going. That's right. All right, go and go and do your mouth beatbox stuff. And, and hello, be <laughs> hello. That's right. I'm gonna go beat myself into a into a tizzy right now, and that's gonna feel real good. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll be. Think there. about that. Yeah, in spirit. Thank you so much for having me on, guys.